Love him, hate him, don't know him. Let's talk about BJ Penn. Many of the younger UFC fans might only know BJ as that over the hill fighter that had a failed comeback tour in 2017. Getting TKO'd by Yair Rodriguez or submitted by Ryan Hall. But when he was at his best, BJ was one scary motherfucker. How many fighters do you know, past or present, that competed in five different weight divisions? Six, if you count open weight. Or a fighter that has a stoppage in every single round. That's right, BJ Penn is the only fighter I know of in the UFC that has a finish in all five rounds. He's also the only fighter in the UFC that won the lightweight and welterweight belts. Don't let his 16 and 14 record fool you. At one time, BJ was ranked number one in both lightweight and welterweight at the same time. As far as I know, he was the only one in the UFC to have won that honor. BJ got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at a young age. His neighbor introduced him to the gentle art when he was searching for people to roll with. Soon after, BJ moved to San Jose to train at the Ralph Gracie Academy. After obtaining his purple belt, BJ moved again this time to Rio de Janeiro to train at the legendary Nova Uniao Academy. Some noticeable fighters that train there include guys like Jose Aldo, JDS, Pedro Hizo, Renan Barral, and the inventor of one of my favorite submissions, the Peruvian necktie, Tony D'Souza. There's a reason BJ's nicknamed the Prodigy. Story goes that BJ got his black belt after only three years of training. Let that sink in for a minute. For most people, it might take a decade to reach that level. BJ got there in three years. In 1998, BJ took second place as a blue belt at the Mundials. In 99, he got third place as a brown belt. And in 2000, first place as a black belt, becoming the first non-Brazilian to win in that division at the Mundials. After racking up wins in more competitions, BJ was brought in to roll with Lorenzo Fertitta and Dana White when they were still getting to know the sport. After impressing the brass, they convinced BJ to transition to MMA. It didn't take BJ long to progress and pick up the skills needed for MMA, especially in the boxing department. Developing good timing and knockout power, BJ made his UFC debut at UFC 31 against Joey Gilbert. BJ torched him in the first round. I love how BJ would just run to the cage. No dance session, no hugging the coaches and their cousins, no crawling into the cage or saying a prayer. He just came to fight with this intense look on his face. Next up was Dean Thomas with a record of 12 and one at the time. So a noticeable step up in competition. BJ came in aggressive and floored Thomas early in the first round with a well-placed knee and then just pounced, TKOing him. At UC 34, BJ faced Cal Uno, who was also way more experienced in MMA, with a record of 13 and 4, and an accomplished grappler in his own right, having won silver at the ADCC. BJ absolutely bulldozed Uno. He laid him out like a stamp collection. Uno's expression was like he had been forced to watch the entire Fast and the Furious series in one setting. And while Uno was still staring into the abyss, BJ just ran out of the cage. They had to go get him to give the Octagon interview. It was stuff like that that made me fall in love with BJ and the sport. BJ had come into the UFC with a ton of hype behind him as a jiu-jitsu guy. But so far, he had been knocking motherfuckers out with gusto. At the time, there were hardly any Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts that could strike like BJ, which made him very dangerous. Even though his stand-up was almost exclusively boxing, his power and timing made up for any lack of variety. After the destruction of Uno, BJ got his first title shot at lightweight against Jens Pulver, who had won the inaugural lightweight championship when he defeated Cal Uno at UFC 30. It was a five-rounder, back and forth, BJ got a takedown and almost submitted Pulver at the end of round two with an armbar. Pulver did tap, but it happened after the bell. In the later rounds, Pulver's experience helped him win the fight. He got a takedown and did some damage and did a bit more on the feet, getting the majority decision. After the Pulver loss, BJ rebounded quickly with a win over Paul Crichton, where BJ outgrappled him big time. 
and ended up TKOing him from the mount. BJ was getting noticeably better, and his next fight before getting another title shot was against fellow black belt Matt Serra. Here, BJ showcased his tremendous takedown defense, stuffing takedown after takedown, and on the feet, BJ was outstriking Serra, getting the decision. After defending the lightweight belt twice, Pulver vacated and left the UC for a while because of a salary dispute, so the rematch was booked between BJ and Uno for the vacant belt. During this time in the UFC, the lightweight division was in real danger of being suspended altogether. People felt like it wasn't stacked enough or that it lacked the star power other divisions had. The lightweight division didn't have the Tito Ortiz's or the Matt Hughes's. The fight was very competitive, unlike the first one. Both guys got takedowns, both guys did some damage on the ground. BJ had good back control like usual. Both guys fought hard. Even the audience scoring had them pretty even. The fight was called a draw and the lightweight division was put on ice for the time being. BJ had let UFC gold slip through his fingers two times now, but that didn't deter him at all. And just like after the Pulver loss, he came back looking better. For the next two years, BJ fought in K1 and Rumble on the Rocks, defeating guys like Takanori Gomi with a rear naked choke, really showing off his ability to take the back and hold it. He fought once more in the UFC before officially leaving the promotion. At UFC 46, he faced Matt Hughes, who at the time was considered to be the best pound for pound fighter in the world. When he faced Penn, he was already 35 and three, and he had defended the welterweight belt five times, clearing out the division. There was a lot of hype surrounding this fight, and understandably so. Could a smaller BJ move up a weight class and even hang with a strong wrestler like Hughes? When Hughes was the big boy on the block, he was taking people's lunch money for real. His stand-up was never anything special, but it didn't really matter. He would just take you down and grind you out. BJ Penn ran through Matt Hughes. He got on top, took his back, and locked in the rear naked choke, winning the welterweight title. And he made it look easy. It was one of the biggest upsets in MMA history. Soon after, BJ left the UFC saying that there weren't any challenging fights left. The UFC stripped BJ of the belt, claiming that he breached his contract. BJ filed a motion to try and stop the UFC from awarding another welterweight belt, basically just trying to hold up the division. It was a whole thing with men in suits speaking legal mumbo jumbo that BJ ended up losing. BJ went back to K1 and Rumble on the Rocks and had a few more fights. He dominated Pillashaw's boyfriend Dwayne Ludwig and just casually outgrappled Rodrigo Gracie, a fifth degree black belt that got gold at the ADCC in 98. At K1 Heroes, Penn fought Lyoto Machida in an open weight bout. BJ was weighing in at 191 or 86 kg, and Machida was 225 or 102 kg. BJ was trying to take Machida down, but was having a hard time due to the size difference, so he just turned it into a slugfest in an attempt to cancel Machida's elusiveness. Machida was awarded the decision win in the end, scoring more points. Even at light heavyweight, BJ's opponent was unable to stop him, showing us just how tough he was. BJ's last fight in K1 was against another Gracie. It was mostly a stand-up fight with BJ landing more and mostly dominating Renzo in the grappling exchanges, winning via decision. Penn was now 4-1 and one in K1, but now it was time to return to the UFC and claim what was his. BJ and Dana kissed and made up and BJ was brought back into the fold. At UFC 58, BJ made his long-awaited welterweight return in a title eliminator against number one contender George St. Pierre. George had been busy busting heads chasing that rematch with Hughes. He had lost the first fight in spectacular fashion when Hughes had countered a Kimura attempt with a step over the head armbar, one of my all-time favorite submissions in the UFC. The fight was good with BJ busting up George's face and stuffing takedowns. George didn't really do much damage, but 
As the fight went on, George was more active and put together some combinations mixed with his wrestling, getting the split decision win. Even though GSP won, a lot of people still felt that BJ was the better fighter. The win wasn't decisive enough. GSP was supposed to go on and fight Hughes, but because of an injury, George had to pull out, and since Hughes had already beat most of the top guys, they brought BJ in for another title shot. At UFC 63, BJ and Hughes faced each other again. Penn was doing better in the striking department, and he was also stuffing takedowns. And even when Hughes got a takedown, BJ took his back and almost submitted him. Later in the fight, BJ slowed down and Hughes overpowered him, putting him in a reverse crucifix and finishing the fight. BJ later said that he had sustained a rib injury in the fight, and that had cost him the win. BJ had lost to Matt Hughes and George St. Pierre, but both guys had their hands full with Penn, having a hard time taking him down, highlighting his takedown defense again. And on the feet, BJ punished both guys. What made this more impressive was that BJ was a lightweight. After his loss to Hughes, Penn went back down to lightweight and just carpet bombed the division, destroying anyone who was foolhardy enough to fight him. This is where BJ created his finest work. A violent display of dominance where guys just melted in front of him. First up on the chopping block was BJ's old buddy, Jens Pulver. The two had been coaching on Tough Season 5, probably the best tough season in my opinion. It had everything, Gabe Rudiger with the tubes up his ass, Diaz getting into it with Carol Parisian, BJ making Pulver look bad. I actually felt kind of bad for Pulver, he's such a nice guy and BJ wasn't exactly making the whole thing a pleasant experience. At the Ultimate Fighter Season 5 Finale, the two got to go at it. It was a back and forth for a bit until BJ took it to the ground, taking Pulver's back, trapping his arm, and getting the rear naked choke. A technique that would be synonymous with BJ Penn. The Ultimate Fighter Season 2 winner Joe Stevenson had a lot of momentum at the time, and many thought that he was going to be the next big thing in the lightweight division. Sean Shirk had won the vacant lightweight belt at UFC 64, but had been stripped when he got caught using the secret juice. So Penn vs. Stevenson turned into a title fight for the vacant belt. BJ was like a buzzsaw in this fight, knocking Stevenson around, cutting him up, and then finally taking the back and trapping the arm, locking in the rear naked choke. It was hard to train for someone like BJ. His legs were incredibly flexible and strong. They were almost like a second pair of arms, and he was able to utilize them like other fighters just couldn't. If BJ got your back, you would be having a damn hard time shaking him off. BJ's first title defense was against Sean Shirk. Shirk had had a hand in rebuilding the lightweight division, even defending his belt once before getting stripped. Shirk, who was very aggressive and had good wrestling, was considered to be one of the best lightweights at the time with a record of 36 and 4. People were expecting a grappling match, but the fight turned out to be entirely on the feet, with Shirk not really trying to get it to the ground. Shirk landed decent leg kicks and a few good shots, but BJ was doing more damage. Towards the end of round 3, BJ caught Shirk with a flying knee punches combo that BJ would sometimes go for. Shirk was dazed and confused when the buzzer rang, saving him. BJ just called the fight right there, saying that he's done. A confused Mario Yamasaki just stood there for a minute, not sure what to do, then decided, fuck it, I'll just let BJ call this one and called off the fight. BJ was offered another shot at welterweight gold. He moved up to fight GSP again, but at this point in time, George had evolved too much. He was just too strong, too fast, and putting it all together just too well. George worked the clinch a lot, wearing BJ down. He got some takedowns that did damage. BJ did land a few good shots, but in the end, 
was just grinded down and overpowered by a bigger GSP. After laying on top of BJ and beating him up for almost a whole round, BJ's corner stopped the fight. There was some controversy surrounding the fight. GSP's corner man was supposedly rubbing George's back with Vaseline or some shit like that. Some officials went into the cage and wiped GSP down with a towel, you know, just in case, I guess. Later, Penn requested that the Nevada State Athletic Commission investigate the incident. They told him that everything was cool, you know, no harm, no foul type of deal. Penn then filed a complaint trying to suspend GSP's fight license, suspend his cut man, a $250,000 fine, and to overturn the decision to a no contest. But the Nevada State Athletic Commission didn't want to hear it. Penn had this annoying habit of running to the Nevada State Athletic Commission and filing complaints when things didn't go his way. Greasegate, as it is known, is still a controversial topic to this day. After the GSP loss, BJ went back down to lightweight and defended his belt against Kenny Florian. BJ dominated here, doing his flying knee combo and stuffing takedowns. Kenny tried, but it was nowhere near enough. BJ ended up taking the back and getting the rear naked. BJ's last successful title defense and win at lightweight came at UFC 107 against the nightmare Diego Sanchez. Well, his face was a nightmare after BJ got done beating him up for five rounds, opening up one of the nastiest cuts I can remember. The doctor stopped the fight and BJ broke the record for most consecutive title defenses at lightweight, which had been two at the time. Sadly, this marked the beginning of the end for the prodigy. BJ had back-to-back -back title fights with Frankie Edgar, losing both times. The two fights were kind of similar with Frankie moving a lot and getting some takedowns. He was also doing a bit more standing with good volume, but he never had BJ hurt or was even close to finishing him. BJ was trying to box and did get some hits in, but as the fight went on, he kind of just faded. BJ had lost his belt and failed to get it back, but before the descent got going, he returned to welterweight and had his rubber match with Matt Hughes at UFC 123. The fight was short, BJ knocked Hughes down and finished him off with punches. This would be the last win BJ had in the UFC until his retirement. BJ had eight more fights in the UFC after the Hughes win, losing seven and having one draw. From 2011 to 2019, BJ fought guys like John Fitch, Nick Diaz, Rory McDonald, Yair Rodriguez, Frankie Edgar, and Clay Guida. He retired and came back, retired again and came back. By the time he fought McDonald, it was painfully obvious that the sport had taken yet another evolutionary leap. And even though BJ had always been a gifted fighter, the new breed had arrived. The Roy McDonald's and the Yair Rodriguez's. He got TKO'd and submitted, but mostly lost via decision. He tried his luck in welterweight, lightweight, and even featherweight, but to no avail. After the John Fitch draw, Penn said that he didn't really take his training seriously anymore. A lack of motivation and too much mileage on the body meant that it was going to be damn near impossible to compete with the hungry up-and-comers. In those early days, BJ could get away with not training that hard or having a sus gas tank. When BJ made his return to the UFC after his K1 adventure, he had proper strength and conditioning coaches and you really could tell. He was the baddest man on the planet during that time. And it was perhaps because of that title that it was hard to walk away from the sport. And even though Dana wanted BJ to retire, he allowed him to come back and try another run because he had a soft spot for him. This was the guy that saved the lightweight division and the first proper star in that weight class. BJ slowly had to come to terms with the fact that the sport had moved on. No doubt feeling regret with past decisions and time wasted, BJ started to get into a lot of trouble in his off time. Some videos surfaced of BJ getting into fights after hours at local bars. He got arrested while driving under the influence as well as a paternity lawsuit filed by the mother of his most recent child. 
After one incident, the UFC decided that enough was enough and cut BJ from the roster in 2019. UFC Hall of Famer, one of the first multi-division champs, BJ had the potential to be one of the greatest of all time. BJ also possessed the dexterity and a flexibility in his legs that was unheard of and still kind of is. Before Khabib ever did his leg wrap move in the UFC, BJ had been doing it a decade earlier. And not only was he able to trap an opponent's legs like Khabib did, he was also able to trap individual limbs with his leg. It was insane. His takedown defense was also something else. It was damn near impossible to take down a fresh BJ. BJ Penn had so many gifts, but as the saying goes, time waits for no man. Not even the baddest motherfucker on the planet. BJ has earned himself a spot among those elite old guards that built the UFC. And because of that, his contribution to the sport won't be forgotten anytime soon. Thank you for tuning in, guys. You know the drill. Like, subscribe, comment, and all that fucking shit. Until next time, hang loose. When you were on top, you were one of the baddest motherfuckers on earth. You really were. He's one of the best 155 pounders of all time. He built that weight class. He just had this intense belief in himself. He would, he would be super, super aggressive too. BJ Penn was born to fight, man. That's what that kid was put on his earth to do.